Uh, thank you very much to uh, organizers of this uh, conference for inviting me uh, here. It's a great pleasure. And it's also a very uh, nice uh, time to talk about uh, uh, planet formation. You know, I'll have a difficult task because I'll try to cover both formation of terrestrial and giant planets because I think uh, uh, the fates of the two kinds of planets are closely intertwined. But as I said, now is a very good time to discuss uh, uh, planet formation because, uh, for example, you know, my personal uh, take on this is when I started in this field about 15 years ago, uh, I heard this uh, great quote from my uh, advisor, uh, Scott Tremaine. And this was pretty much, uh, you know, how the things were uh, developing at that stage. We had uh, uh, just, uh, you know, statistics of uh, planets uh, increasing, you know, in the, all these discoveries of Kuiper Belt objects and so on, and not enough theories at the time. And most of these theories were kind of, you know, killing each other. They were prohibiting planet formation uh, in various different ways. So I hope to appreciate that the situation has changed uh, to some extent in recent years, and despite some certain, you know, problems and issues, uh, we now have a somewhat better view of uh, uh, the formation of uh, planets uh, in a universe. Okay, so one important thing that has been emphasized many, many times uh, through these talks, but I just, you know, uh, pointed, I po pointed out again as a theorist, is that uh, planet formation is always squeezed into this uh, 3 to uh, 10 million year uh, time scale uh, that is allowed uh, to it by observations. We have observations of gas uh, inferred in terms of the mass uh, accretion rates onto the parent star, as well as uh, CO observations uh, of, the, um, uh, of uh, uh, just gaseous disks around stars, which tell us uh, uh, quite unambiguously that uh, uh, the amount of gas is dropping, uh, is falling off on a time scale of about 10 million years in these disks. And we also have this near infrared accesses that signify presence of dust, of small particles, the building blocks of uh, planets. Uh, and uh, uh, these near infrared accesses also tend to decay on uh, the time scale of about 3 to 10 uh, million years in different, uh, in different stellar associations. So that clearly tells us that any theory of planet formation has to be able to form giant planets on a time scale uh, which doesn't exceed 10 million years. This is not true for the terrestrial planets. Terrestrial planets can take longer to form, uh, but since we think that uh, in many cases uh, terrestrial planets are an integral part of the giant planet formation, they need to understand how uh, big cores can be formed on a pretty short, uh, uh, within a pretty short uh, span of time. So let me start with the formation of uh, terrestrial planets. Uh, quite loosely, you know, it's a very uh, complicated uh, process. It's, you know, it can be well described by this ladder going from 0.1 micron uh, size grains in protoplanetary disks, uh, going all the way to planetesimals. And, you know, I use the term planetesimal here uh, uh, very loosely. It's something, uh, some object that interacts with other objects of its kind, mainly by gravity, and is largely decoupled from the gas. Uh, and then going all the way to cores, uh, to planets and cores with uh, sizes of about 10 to the 4 kilometers. So it's many, many, many orders of magnitude and radius, uh, three times more orders of magnitude and mass. And you go through a lot of complicated and quite different uh, processes in each of these, uh, in each of these uh, stages. So uh, loosely over the years, people have grouped this uh, planet for terrestrial planet formation into three stages, going from dust to planetesimals, from planetesimals to the so-called protoplanetary embryos, and then from embryos to fully blown cores. And let me uh, quickly review these uh, different stages and uh, emphasize different problems that we are facing uh, in uh, their understanding. So first, uh, let's talk about uh, going from dust uh, uh, to planetesimals. Uh, historically, there has been two kinds of uh, processes, two kinds of theories that were used to, uh, that were used to um, describe formation of uh, planetesimals. They can be grouped into a sort of, oh, oops, sorry into the coagulation theories, which basically rely on the pairwise collisions of a huge number of particles uh, growing into bigger and bigger bodies and, you know, finally forming uh, some big uh, objects, as well as on a collective processes in which you start with a sea of small particles and then some collective process, such as gravitational stability, uh, collapses, uh, bring them together, and you get uh, a big body. Uh, historically, gravitational stability was probably the first process uh, proposed, and it was a, a Goldreich and Ward uh, paper in uh, the beginning of 70s. But then it was uh, killed by Jeff uh, Kazi, who said that, well, no, it's not going to work because of the self-excited Kelvin help instability as the dust is settling towards the uh, disk uh, midplane. Uh, then, you know, everybody was believing f into coagulation for a long time, uh, but, you know, then people realized that sticking probabilities of dust particles are not good enough, and so that theory was, was, killed, as, uh, was killed again. So this was pretty much the state of the art when I entered this uh, field, and I was looking at it, and, you know, there was clearly no understanding of how planetesimals uh, form uh, at the time. So let me just, you know, uh, quickly uh, go through the uh, 
uh, coagulation. Well, coagulation, they think, is nice. I mean, it's a natural process. Particles will collide with each other. Uh, and uh, they actually will grow when they are small enough. When you go from about 0.1 micron to like one millimeter size particles, molecular forces are effective enough in binding uh, uh, objects uh, together. However, as you go to bigger and bigger sizes, uh, you run into problem and you find uh, that the growth uh, stalls simply because the sticking probability becomes uh, extremely low uh, in, the average, uh, in the average sense. Uh, there are other problems associated with the slow sort of coagulative growth of uh, particles and one of them, uh, and very important one, is of course the uh, famous one meter problem which uh, arises because gas in the protoplanetary disk is uh, moving slower at a slower angular frequency uh, than particles. As a result, particles feel uh, headwind, they lose angular momentum, they spiral in on, onto the stars. This process is maximized uh, when the stopping time is about, uh, the, is about local dynamical time and at one AU it's, it's a one meter uh, size uh, object. So that's why it's called a one meter problem. And any slow process of growth of particles have to somehow also be able to overcome uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, issue. So in recent years, uh, people have been inventing different ways of uh, how this problem with the sticking uh, probability, low sticking probabilities can be overcome. First way is, well, quite natural. Why don't we increase the sticking probabilities? Uh, usually, uh, I mean, many statements on uh, the low sticking probabilities involve a collision of particles such as ice balls and so on. Uh, so you might want to uh, think about some other materials. For example, things that are porous, icy, ice coated, you know, something that has, you know, higher chances, uh, to, higher chances to stick. And if you do that, you can quite naturally uh, get uh, coagulation and growth to uh, bigger sizes. Uh, unfortunately, at the time, it's not clear whether, this, uh, whether these improvements will work. And uh, clearly, uh, quite a lot of uh, additional experimental work is still needed in this, uh, in this uh, area. Uh, another quite interesting approach uh, has emerged in the last uh, couple of years, pioneered by uh, Windmar et al. in 2012 and uh, Garaud et al. 2012, who have pointed uh, attention to the fact uh, that uh, coagulative growth is actually a stochastic process. Uh, of course, you know, when particle velocities are very high in a, a root mean square sense, uh, the growth is very unlikely. But uh, this is a probabilistic, probabilistic statement and there is always some probability that particles will actually approach each other with small velocity, not a large one. Uh, also, uh, sticking is uh, you know, also a probabilistic uh, process, so the sticking outcome can also have a chance, even if small one, uh, of uh, uh, you know, binding uh, particles together. And then if you take uh, this into account, and you take into account that you have enormous number of particles, so that even unlikeliest outcomes may emerge in this uh, system of huge number of bodies, you actually find that you can get beyond this uh, one millimeter uh, size, and this is what's shown, you know, time evolution of the uh, uh, particle distribution in one of the simulations uh, uh, done by Garaud, you can see uh, the, uh, that by taking into account these unlikely, uh, unlikely outcomes, they actually are able to grow particles up to you know, tens of meters. And this is, I think, is a very promising and very interesting uh, direction, uh, uh, not only for the coagulation of dust particles. Uh, but if, uh, uh, since, uh, since, you know, since there are all these uh, serious issues, uh, people have started thinking about different processes that can uh, give, rise to, uh, give rise to the formation of planetesimals. And, uh, you know, this uh, typically involves uh, concentrating dust particles into some region uh, to very high densities where gravitational uh, instability can sort of set in when they become self-gravitating and uh, start forming uh, bound clumps. And uh, the first, uh, first papers devoted to uh, sort of uh, different secular instabilities uh, that might actually lead to the concentration of dust particles uh, uh, to high densities uh, by, for example, you know, turbulence or interaction with gas drag, streaming instabilities, and so on and so forth, vortices, uh, have appeared around the uh, year of 2000. It was Goodman and Pinder, then uh, Yudin and Chang, Yudin and Goodman, uh, and so on and so forth. So there has been a lot of development in this, in this direction. Actually, it all has started essentially uh, in uh, just uh, within 15 years. Uh, and you can see one of the simulations by Anders Johansson. You know, this is an MRI turbulent uh, disk in which uh, uh, you clearly see particles getting concentrated, you know, uh, you get formation of these dense clumps uh, that, you know, accrete more and more mass that merge with each other and that end up producing uh, mass, quite massive objects. So in this way, by, uh, by doing, this, uh, by doing th this kind of uh, calculations, people have shown the possibility of actually bypassing completely this one meter problem, that you can start with objects which are sub one meter in size and actually jump all the way up to several tens or even hundreds of kilometers. 
That is uh, quite remarkable, and whether this occurs uh, is uh, actually in, is intertwined with some other uh, aspects of uh, planet formation, as I will uh, describe next. So the next stage is uh, going from these uh, planetesimals uh, to protoplanetary embryos. Here again, we are dealing with a system that contains enormous number of bodies. It's like 10 to the 12 of uh, one, sorry, uh, 10 to the 12 of one uh, kilometer uh, sized bodies at uh, one AU. And you can just think of them as a gas of gravitating particles. Their orbits overlap, uh, you know, they form this uh, 3D system of essentially gravitating particles, which is gravitation, which is, experience mutual encounters and increase uh, random velocities uh, of each other. So that you basically take the orbital energy of these particles and pump, pump, pump it into the uh, random energy of their epicyclic, uh, epicyclic motion. Gas is not so important at this stage. It is important only uh, via the aerodynamic drag uh, onto, the, onto these particles, but you know, all these collective effects that were important for the planetesimal formation are now essentially uh, gone. And then if particles have low enough velocities, uh, they can actually stick with each other with essentially a probability of equal, equal to unity. That happens uh, whenever the relative velocities of particles are below their mutual escape velocity. And escape velocity is just simply estimated as about one meter per second for one kilometer sized body. So that is a very small velocity. You really need to have, you know, the growth of one meter size, uh, one kilometer sized objects requires random velocities to be as low as one meter per second. That is quite impressive, but we think that you know, these conditions have to be realized in this uh, classical picture of the uh, planetesimal uh, growth. And then when, when, the, when this happens, when this really happens, then you do get efficient growth of uh, objects in uh, collisions. This has been uh, demonstrated by a number of uh, calculations uh, just to show that this field is more or less mature and it has pretty long history. This is a, this is a calculation uh, done by Kinnan and Lou back in 1998 uh, uh, when they uh, looked at the formation of the Kuiper belt. But this particular simulation is addressing the formation of uh, the inner part of the solar system. So by starting with about 10 kilometer sized objects uh, uh, at time equal zero, they see, uh, they see the development of essentially like a power law tail of objects on a time scale of several times 10 to the four years, several tens of uh, thousands of years. And then what interesting thing happens, you typically in this simulation see the emergence of this uh, a runaway tail of particles. So essentially, these particles emerge and start, grow, and start growing very, very rapidly. So that the rest of the uh, distribution is essentially frozen while the rest, while, while this uh, small number of these particles can reach very high uh, masses. And so here, on a time scale of about 10 to the 5 years, you form objects embryo with masses of about 10 to the 26, uh, 10 to the 26 grams. So it seems nice, you know, beautiful, everything works. Uh, however, uh, recently there has been some recent uh, controversies and uh, problems as I would uh, put them. And these controversies have to do with the detailed comparison of these uh, uh, theories of coagulation with the data. So what sort of data do we have to test uh, these uh, theories on? Uh, we cannot uh, look at asteroid belts around other stars. They are too far away, you know, they're too faint. It's impossible to see them. We can only see uh, dust tails produced in fragmentation. But he, there we are talking about, you know, like sort of millimeter sized, uh, distribution of millimeter sized grains and so on. Uh, so the best chances of comparing uh, coagulation theories to reality are in our own solar system. And in, for example, in 2009, uh, Morbidelli have done a simulation in which they tried uh, to uh, model uh, growth in the asteroid belt, starting with bodies of different sizes, and try to compare their results with uh, actual observations which are given by this uh, gray line. Uh, and this is a sort of range of uncertainties that is, uh, uh, that is observed. So they find that when they start with small uh, objects, about two kilometers in size, they actually don't fit this, uh, you know, this uh, kind of uh, transition, this uh, uh, kind of kink in the distribution of uh, sizes. And they actually get, you know, sort of continuous distribution of sizes, which they said, uh, you know, just basically excludes uh, small initial sizes of planetesimals as uh, building blocks of asteroids. So when they did a uh, simulation with, you know, 100 to 500 kilometer sized objects, basically this initial uh, size distribution, then they, you know, naturally get this thing and basically it's a, an argument in favor of uh, large massive bodies, pretty much as what you can get from these streaming instabilities that I uh, showed you before. 
Now, in a Kuiper Belt, uh, uh, in the Kuiper Belt uh, growth has been investigated for a long time by uh, Kenyan and uh, many uh, other people. Uh, but he recently, Hilke Schlichting, and this will be uh, her presentation, actually, so I just uh, stole a couple of uh, plots from it, essentially, uh, show that you, in this case, you do need the small bodies. Like, one kilometer sized bodies actually allow you to fit very well the observed dis distribution of sizes in the, in, in the Kuiper Belt and do not violate the constraints uh, on the number of small particles imposed by the tau occultation survey. Uh, if you put in, if she was putting in 10 kilometer sized bodies and finding a gross disagreement both here and the violation of the uh, Taos criterion. Uh, and I uh, also encourage you to, to sort of add to this controversy, you know, who is right, you know, whether uh, growth starts with small or large bodies. I would, uh, I would encourage you to talk to Andrew Shannon, his poster 716, who is advocating the use of even smaller particles, the size of about one centimeters, uh, to get efficient growth in a, a Kuiper belt. And now there is what I call a problem, uh, what I see as a problem, that also has been emerging quite, uh, quite recently. Uh, Shigeru Ida in 2008 with his collaborators have brought attention to the fact uh, that uh, any kind of turbulence in a, a protoplanetary disk, and we know that we need turbulence to get the disk uh, accreted onto the star, uh, any kind of turbulence is going to produce density and homogeneities in a disk. This density and homogeneities will give gravitational perturbations that will excite random motions of planetesimals in exactly the same way as the mutual encounters of planetesimals do the same job. So uh, this random excitation uh, has such a character that it can actually bring the velocities and eccentricities of particles to pretty high values. And here I'm just, uh, uh, st I have stolen a, a plot from the paper by Chris Armel, uh, and just concentrate on these large uh, size objects. So this is basically the dust regime which I talked before. But in the large size objects, this, this dashed curve is showing you the velocity uh, due to this turbulent excitation by uh, uh, density perturbations in, in a nebula. As you can see, these velocities are pretty high. You know, eccentricity is at the level of several times 10 to the minus 3. Velocity is at the level of, you know, like uh, hundreds of meters per second. This is going to make a growth of hun even 100 uh, kilometer sized bodies uh, very difficult. And you can see that, you know, this curve crosses over with the uh, curve of the V escape, escape velocity beyond which the growth becomes very efficient only at sizes of several tens of kilometers. So, uh, a anything, all the objects in between, like, you know, starting with, uh, let's say, 100 meters to several tens of kilometers, are going to, to, to have very high velocity excitation produced by the turbulence, and that is a problem. That will lead to highly erosive uh, collisions between uh, objects, and as a result, it will create some sort of, uh, uh, essentially, destruction zones in your uh, protoplanetary disk. Uh, so this is a, you know, a calculation from the IDA uh, paper where they look at three different uh, locations uh, in a nebula. Uh, this is a radius of the object, this is a mass of the disk. Uh, as you increase the mass of the disk, you expect these density perturbations to become more and, and more uh, important, the velocity excitation stronger and stronger. And then you find that there is this you know, range of, uh, range of uh, sizes within which basically particles cannot grow. Here they are going to be destructed in mutual, in mutual uh, encounters. So what is a way of, uh, uh, of you know, bypassing this problem? Uh, I personally view this as a very serious problem. So I think uh, we need to uh, really think about it and uh, you know, put it, uh, try to put it in our calculation, uh, calculations, for example. Uh, one, one possibility is that uh, all planetesimals form in that zone. In that zones where MRI is not uh, operating, ionization is low, and then you know, we can uh, wiggle our way out of it. Or it could be that we need a better treatment of, of collisions. So uh, talk to Zoe Lenhardt and maybe she will cook up some recipe for uh, doing uh, this for you. Then uh, this idea of stochastic coagulation, I think, is quite promising to be applied for this uh, regime of you know, turbulence-excited planetesimals as well. And then finally, uh, just direct simulations, uh, not, not, not parameterization of turbulence in some uh, artificial way, but direct simulations of particles embedded in MRI uh, active disks such as the ones done by uh, Chao Chin Yang, actually show that this excitation may not be so serious. So there could be ways of uh, actually overcoming this problem uh, quite naturally. But anyway, so I, as I said, I mean, I think this is interesting and I think we should uh, actually worry about this. So even the, just the plain uh, vanilla growth of plintesimals is actually a quite important and still problem which is still riddled with some uh, uncertainties uh, and uh, conundrums. Now let me switch to uh, formation of uh, uh, giant planets because uh, definitely there are issues uh, in this uh, stage of uh, uh, producing gas giants uh, uh, as well. So, uh, and of course we all know and love the two uh, contender theories. Uh, in, this, in, this, in, this, in the field of giant planet formation everything is simple. 
you know, we have two theories, we just need to decide uh, uh, which, one, uh, which one do you like. So I'll start with the one which sort of historically was uh, more favored for the last about uh, 30 years, and that's uh, core accretion. Core accretion naturally emerges when you have a massive uh, uh, protoplanetary core, like a solid body, that you stick in a nebula. When you stick it in a nebula, its gravity is going to attract an atmosphere on the surface of the core. Uh, that's an important effect when the mass of the core is about, uh, you know, lunar mass or so. Uh, beyond that mass, the core just doesn't stick to an atmosphere on its surface even. Uh, but when, when it's more massive, you get an atmosphere and the core uh, is supposed to grow by accretion of planetesimals. So you have these planetesimals constantly bombarding uh, the core. Uh, as the mass of the core grows, the mass of the atmosphere increases as well. Uh, this is not a simple atmosphere because uh, it's not like an isothermal atmosphere. Uh, this atmosphere is actually heated by this energy release produced by the planetesimal striking the surface of the core and by radioactive energy uh, release inside of the core as well. So you actually have to go uh, through something like a stellar uh, uh, evolution-like uh, type calculation to figure out exactly what are the details of the structure of this, uh, of this uh, envelope. But nevertheless, uh, we do believe that uh, at some point core becomes so massive that the envelope around it, uh, the mass of this envelope is comparable to the mass of the core itself. And in this case, uh, there is an insta well, it's not an instability, it's kind of, uh, uh, it's, well, it's core accretion. You get, uh, you get, a, you get a, an accretion of gas on a thermal time scale onto this uh, essentially self-gravitating uh, uh, object. For a long, for, for long time, for many years, I was calling it core, core, core instability because, you know, uh, everybody was doing this and, you know, I got punished many times by people. Okay, um, anyway, so um, yes, so uh, core accretion, core accretion. So core accretion, what it does to you, it does allow you the formation of uh, Jupiter-like planet at, let's say, uh, 5 AU, which these calculations by Movshevitz and uh, collaborators clearly show. Starting with different uh, surface densities of uh, solids, just to illustrate it, to get a faster growth uh, for uh, more denser, for denser uh, disks, you find that, well, initially you start in a runaway regime. This is a, so, uh, this is a mass of the solid core initially starts as a, as a runaway, then it switches to a slower uh, oligarchy growth, and this is the mass of the gas. So the mass of the gas increases, increases, then, you know, the two become roughly equal and you basically shoot up. So you get this very rapid uh, increase of mass, of gaseous mass uh, of the core, and this is, uh, this is a core instability as we know and love it. So core instability is great because it does allow us to naturally explain a number of uh, facts that we know about planets. First of all, it uh, as, since it requires a core, it quite naturally explains presence of the cores. Uh, and presence of the cores is definitely inferred in uh, most of the solar system planets. Uh, maybe not in Jupiter, there is a lot of controversy related to the equation of state. Uh, but uh, definitely for you know, Saturn, uh, Uranus, and Neptune, we know that there are cores. In extrasolar planetary systems, uh, we also know that some of, the, some of the planets, I mean, some of the planets we know are too large. But some of them are too small to be composed of uh, just pure hydrogen and helium. And we know that we need cores with masses of about you know, 30 to 50 uh, Earth's masses in many of these uh, planets. So this whole range you know, between 5 to 50 uh, Earth masses is actually something that can be easily accommodated by the core accretion uh, theory in different uh, disguises. So that, that I view as a success of the uh, theory. Then, of course, there is a, a natural explanation of the metallicity correlation. Uh, because, uh, well, as I showed uh, in this plot, the higher, is, uh, the higher is the surface density of solids, the higher is the metallicity, the faster growth, the easier it is to form um, uh, giant planets. And so within a core accretion uh, framework, you very naturally get this thing uh, going. However, there is a problem when you try to look at, uh, when you try to look at systems like HR 8799 and say that they are also formed by core accretion. Because as you go very far uh, from the star, all dynamical time scales tend to increase dramatically as, you know, second to third power of the distance. And you actually find that it's very, very hard to form something by, uh, to form any massive core uh, very far, uh, you know, from the star at a distance of about 100 astronomical units. So you need some way of actually boosting up the accretion rate. You need to increase, uh, you accelerate accretion. But when you do that, there is another problem that you have to face. Uh, the critical core mass, uh, as I said, I mean, it does depend on, on the luminosity of, uh, of this, you know, that's coming off the surface of the core. So as you increase the mass accretion rate of particles onto the core, you have to increase the critical core mass. So you're basically running uh, uh, to get to, you know, you're, you're running very, very fast, but that uh, uh, sort of makes your goal even more remote uh, than you had it before. 
This is kind of a nuisance. It's not, it does, it's not a killer for the whole thing. You still need to somehow accelerate uh, formation of planets as much as possible. And I was thinking for a long time, you know, how this can be done. Uh, and actually, in uh, 2004, I came up with this um, idea, which seems natural, uh, at least uh, to me, that things could be, follow could be happening in uh, this uh, natural way. So initially, as a result of a runaway accretion somewhere you know, far from the star, you get some big uh, protoplanetary core or embryo that starts growing. As it grows, it switches to an oligarchic regime in which it basically its gravity dom it dominates excitation of planetesimal velocities. It scatters them up to very high uh, speeds and it essentially stops accreting because in oligarchic regime, uh, accretion is very inefficient. However, uh, what else will be happening in this system is that these particles will be colliding with velocities, planetesimals are going to be colliding with velocities which are super escape for them. You will, in these collisions, you will produce huge amount of debris and this debris will actually couple to the gas that's still, that is still around. Since I'm trying to explain formation of giant planets, I do need to have gas, uh, gas around in the system. And so this coupling to the gas of these of this, uh, small fragments of these debris can actually help, uh, help us to you know, concentrate debris very close to the mid-plane and will allow a very effective accretion of these particles by the cores. So uh, simulations by Kenyon and Bromley in 2009 have actually, correlation simulations accounting for this effect, have actually shown that that really is what's happening. And that does allow you to form, for example, Neptune within uh, 10 million years or so. And uh, if I take this very fast, if, they, if I take this very fast mode of uh, planetesimal uh, accretion of, of core, core growth and try to, you know, uh, run, uh, go through a set of analytical calculations, I do find that I can set an upper limit on the right size of the region within which uh, planets can still form by uh, core accretion. And that's, that, that's, you know, that size is basically 40 to 50 AU for this very fast accretion regime that I just described before. Okay, so it still is very difficult to form planets at, let's say, 100 AU. You, to, to, to do that, you really need to somehow accelerate the growth even more. And the next uh, talk by Michael Lambrecht will address uh, this possibility by uh, resorting to the so-called uh, pebble accretion uh, idea. Okay, uh, now let me spend the remaining several minutes uh, to the uh, idea of the gravitational instability. Uh, so here we are uh, dealing with uh, something that can produce uh, planets uh, very rapidly on a very short time scale. So you start with a disk which is tumor unstable in the sense of tumor Q parameter, and very quickly you produce these beautiful, you know, spiral arms, and you do get this, uh, well, this uh, beautiful, well, planets. So you do form these uh, planets. However, I have to warn you that this simulation is a big cheat. This simulation is using uh, isothermal equation of state, and this is why it's producing planets. Uh, in reality, uh, Planet formation, uh, in reality, uh, gravitational stability does not necessarily mean planet formation. To have gravitational stability just allows, uh, just allows you to uh, start producing perturbations in a disk, in a linear regime. But then to get them growing, you actually, when you go to the nonlinear regime, you also have to satisfy additional constraints. And you need to be able, the disk has to be able to fragment, to fall apart into pieces. Uh, it has been shown by ma many people, uh, starting with uh, Charles Gamma in 2001, uh, that uh, fragmentation actually requires very short cooling, cooling, uh, very effective uh, cooling uh, in a disk. And for example, you know, here you can compare two uh, global simulations by uh, Ken Rice, one having uh, somewhat uh, shorter cooling time than another. Here you, the disk settles in a state of the so-called gravity turbulence when it just you know, simmers on the verge of gravitational stability, but no uh, permanent over density is formed here. While here you get a whole bunch of these small knots, which are basically these planets that form in this case. Uh, now, what, 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 what is the situation in a protoplanetary disk? Whether you should expect this outcome or this one? Well, it turns out that in uh, real protoplanetary disks, you should expect disks to be uh, stable against fragmentation, at least within uh, their inner parts. That's because the cooling time uh, in this uh, disk, which are very massive, so the surface density is very high, and, and still are quite cold to get the instability going so that the effective temperature from the surface of the disk is very low. The effective, the, the cooling time is very much longer than a, a local dynamical time. And that's a problem for forming planets in the inner parts of the disks. Some other issues with gravitational stability involve, for example, the masses of fragments. These fragments tend to form these masses of about several Jupiter masses. And after that, they are actually going to grow even more, which has been demonstrated by uh, Caitlin Crater, Andrew Eugen, and uh, uh, Ruth Murray Clay, because you have enormous supply of gas, very massive disk. 
This very massive disk is also very likely to uh, cause uh, inward motion of uh, planets towards a central star so that they can get lost there. And you need to worry about all these survivability issues for a very long time because the conditions for the gravitational stability very likely realize only the, in the very beginning of the planet formation when the disk is still very massive and accretes at very high rates. So then, you know, you form planets in the first 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 years of the lifetime of the disk, but then you have to keep them somehow for several million years. And that's not easy. Things actually get somewhat easier, uh, at least in terms of forming fragments, uh, far from the star at separations of about 70 to 100 AU, where uh, Madsner and Levin uh, have uh, demonstrated that, you know, for opacity uh, typical for cold uh, dust particles, you do get uh, fragmentation uh, naturally going uh, in uh, disks. And so uh, then, in principle, one can envisage a picture. There is nothing uh, wrong with it that, you know, uh, core accretion will actually be forming planets uh, within, let's say, 50 to 70 U, and outside of this region, uh, gravitational instability will be uh, doing the job. So uh, how do we dis disentangle these possibilities? I mean, if we see these different populations, what do we do? Well, one way is to, for example, look at the, you know, how, how the uh, different populations go with metallicity. If these di distant directly imaged planets uh, don't obey the normal metallicity correlation and do something else, that is going to tell us something. Next thing is uh, you, you want to look at the physical properties of these directly uh, imaged uh, planets. For example, at, you know, compare cold start and hot start models because we think that hot start definitely uh, means gravitational stability and cold or warm start is uh, calling in favor of uh, uh, core accretion. So you basically you know, want to compare the spectrum, for example, of the uh, red spectrum here uh, in this plot taken from Spiegel and Burroughs is uh, the spectrum of the hot start model. It's quite different from the blue spectrum of the uh, cold start model. And you know, the many curves just show you the time evolution of this whole thing. So the future in terms of deciding between these uh, two models, I think, in my opinion, lies exactly in the success of the direct, direct imaging service, such as Sphere and GPI. So I very much uh, encourage you know, people involved in, in, in these things to you know, work very hard and find, find more planets at large separations. And uh, so I'll, I'll leave you with this uh, somewhat philosophical set of uh, conclusions, and uh, thank you very much. Thanks for getting us started after the, coffee, or the lunch break. Uh, so we have time, actually, for some questions. So if anybody has any questions, I can see why the, it's really hard to see out there. So um, but yes, there, thanks. So I really liked your talk. Um, in your theory about how um, you can form the outer planets if you have fragmentation of planetesimals into smaller sizes and then the dust settles toward the midplane where it can be easily accreted, um, I'm wondering if you can explain a little bit more because I'm thinking that if the dust it, so if the dust gets to be too small, then it'll just be entrained in the gas and it won't settle very far down. Whereas if it doesn't get to be small enough, so if you have centimeter to meter sizes, then it will spiral in towards the star. So it seems like you need this very finely tuned regime where Sure, it's sure. I, I totally, I totally, I, I think I understand what you, what you mean. So first of all, I think going all the way to very small uh, sizes in a gas-rich environment is not very easy because as soon as the object becomes small, they actually, their velocities, you know, they get dynamically cooled by gas. They sediment towards the midplane and their relative velocities are going to be uh, reduced uh, as the sizes uh, basically go down. So essentially, I think, you know, I've never done an actual calculation, but, you know, I believe that you can actually stop fragmentation at some uh, critical size. What this critical size is, well, it's not clear. Uh, this model was, was designed basically to explain formation of Neptune. And for Neptune, uh, I was able to show that this whole thing, uh, this very efficient formation of Neptune, will operate even if these fragments uh, have sizes of about 10 meters to 100 meters. These fragments are definitely safe from uh, you know, very rapid uh, drift on you know, very short time scale. They will still be drifting a little bit, but you know, on a way in, they will be intercepted by these you know, growing embryos and so on. So it may not be so bad. Michael Liu. Just a comment and a question. The comment is, um, as uh, you know, GPI and Sphere and all these other projects get going, it's actually probably going to be terribly difficult, actually, once you take a picture of the planet, to decide whether it was a cold start planet, a warm start planet, or a hot start planet. So that's kind of, um, I mean, 
Well, that, I mean, that's kind that, of, uh, so, so that, that's why I resorted to these things like, you know, to this spectroscopy, as you can see, you know, here the spectrum of the cold start mod of the hot start model is quite different from the spectrum of the uh, cold start model. So maybe there is something in here that you right, can but you, unfortunately, unfortunately, you won't know the age, so you won't actually know which model to pick. But that's, that's just a comment. My question is, you said something very briefly, which I wanted to actually see if you would solidify. You, just, you said very unambiguously, you know, gravitational instability equals hot start and core accretion equals cold plus warm start. Mm -hmm. Do you feel comfortable asserting that direct mapping of the thermal models to the I mean, gravitational models? instability, of, gravitational instability uh, operates on a very short time scale, typically several dynamical time scales. That's why it was kind of resurrected. It's one of these zombie theories that has been brought back. I mean, it was developed by Kuiper in the 50s. Then Alan Boss liked it uh, just because, you know, it produces planets very easily and un overcomes all these pr problems inherent for the co uh, core accretion. When something operates in a short time scale, you essentially tend to retain all, all, the, all the heat, all the entropy that you have uh, in your system. And in this case, you will be starting with the entropy of just the nebula. Nebular entropy is enormous just simply because the density is so low. So you're going to have an object which is, uh, has very high entropy. And so this is the hottest star that, in, that you can uh, ever imagine uh, you know, in your system. Anything else, as soon as you have accretion shocks which are radiative that lose energy away from the system, if you have a disk with like a boundary layer out of which the planet uh, is accreting, that's going to remove entropy from the system and give you warm and cold start models. Just down here in the front. Hi. Uh, when I, I look at the simulation from gravitational instability, I see many planets are created on similar orbits. Do you expect more planets scattering and different eccentricity distribution for those? planets born through gravitational instability than co-accretion? Probably. Uh, it's, 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 you know, it, it, it's, qu it's quite possible the problem with, uh, you know, uh, gravitational stability is that you, s you, you, you want to find ways of actually keeping these planets, uh, uh, you know, keeping these planets in the system. As I said, uh, you know, you, you need to wait for several million years for these guys to survive in a nebula, which is very, very massive. It was able to give birth to these to this, to this, uh, planets, so it's very massive. There is very strong gravitational interaction between the nebula and the planets. And, you know, my feeling, which is supported actually by simulations by uh, people like Vorobyov and Basu, is that a lot of these uh, planets which were formed early on will just end up on a central star. So before worrying about the eccentricity of surviving systems, you know, we need to figure out, you know, what is the branching ratio, how many, what is a fraction of systems that actually survive. One comment and question. Uh, first of all, uh, core accretion can also give you a hot start because there could be mergers of uh, gas giants and they're at the time when they actually accrete very quickly in the end. And this uh, is the first very of the approximation. Uh, and, uh, second point is that uh, in your presentation, you hardly touched on type one migration. And that seems to be a key component in the formation of plantasma. Do you want to comment on that? Well, I think that, well, migration is a very uh, serious issue here. I just wanted to uh, basically cover uh, the aspects of forming, you know, planets as a physical uh, entities. And as you see, I barely, uh, barely made it. Uh, so if I would uh, touch on uh, the issues of migration, you know, type 1 or type 2, inward or outward, rotation versus Lindblad, that would be, you know, an hour and a half talk, unfortunately. So what is my own take? Well, uh, right, now, uh, right now we know that the migration, at, at least, you know, as it follows from analytical calculations and simulations, seems to be extremely efficient. And you really need some way of actually stopping it, you know, find some parking mechanism of, for planets to stop migrating uh, or uh, find some way of reverting uh, the migration direction. And there has been a certain amount of work in recent years, I'm sure you are aware, aware of this work, you know, how all this folds into the planet formation uh, theories, you know, I don't know because right now we don't understand the uh, migration uh, very well. It's still way too efficient uh, to allow uh, formation of planets, you know, for example, Earth at the, uh, 1 AU, it's difficult. So if you would have an Earth and stick it in the gaseous nebula. Uh, down here, James. Thank you. I, I, I just wanted to agree with Mike Lou uh, that at least for any you know, one object, you might have difficulty measuring the heat in the formation, but uh, I want to point out that Sphere and GPI are statistical surveys, so they'll be ensembles. Exactly. 
and it's certainly clear, at least from the simulations, that the ensemble detected objects very clearly d d discriminate between at least a, a bimodal prediction. So Doug, of course, has thrown a spanner in that by <laughs> saying that you can mix things up. But at least the heat of formation, I think, is going to, be, going, to be, going to be something that's well characterized by these large statistical surveys. Yeah, I think it's very important that we are talking about uh, large statistics of the systems. And another key thing that I, you know, I mentioned and I want to emphasize again is that with this uh, service, we hopefully might be able to see some, whether there is something like a metallicity correlation for these uh, you know, distant uh, planets and whether it's the same or you know, I would expect it to be different uh, than for the planets uh, much closer into their parent stars. One last question up at the back there. So um, is, is it possible, do, I mean, do, what, what do you think of the idea of perhaps of forming the HR8799 planets um, in a sort of packed oligarchy formation and then scattering them out and then they become gravitationally unstable? And more generally, how would you distinguish between um, a scenario where you're probing a disk instability populated, uh, population and one where scattering is important. It seems the two can both park planets at wide separations. Well, I think, you know, HR 8799, it's, you know, at least for me, it's hard to imagine that these guys were formed by scattering. I mean, you have three planets at very large separations, which are, as far as, you know, astrometry tells us, are moving on essentially circular orbits. I don't see how you can have this very efficient gun sitting somewhere in the center of the system and, you know, shooting such massive objects out and, you know, then circularizing them and then producing uh, this uh, giant planet. So I find it uh, really difficult to believe, but, you know, nature may be smarter than I am. Still, I think it should be extremely efficient uh, process in which, you know, they are not affecting uh, uh, each other and, uh, you know, I, I just find it very unlikely. I think you need, to, you need to worry about something local, whether extending core accretion out to lar larger separations or doing gravitational stability in some of these guys. Okay, I think we've got the discussion off to a great start. Thank you very much. <laughs>